All right, let's take a look at example 15. Now example 15 is super long and it's designed to kind of take you all the way through chapters one and two. This culminating problem of, hey, we've gone over these ideas. Can you do a problem where I, I ask you about one of the concepts, or at least in this case, almost all of the concepts from chapters one and two. So I'm gonna read this, all right? And then I'm gonna start with my, my question I always start with, what is the variable? Okay, 65 randomly selected car salespersons were asked the number of cars they generally sell in one week. 14 people answered that they generally sell three cars, 19 generally sell four cars, 12 generally sell five cars, nine generally sell six, and 11 generally sell seven. Complete the table. All right, before I even get into that, what was the variable? I see my sample was 65. All right, 65 salesperson. So when I went up to that salesperson, what was I asking them? I wasn't asking them if they had oatmeal for breakfast today. I wasn't asking them if they collect Star Wars figures. I was asking them, hey, how many cars did you sell that week? And you can see this variable here. It's the number of cars the salesperson sells in a week, right? So my variable, number of cars sold in one week. So here what I'm asking you to do is create a frequency distribution, relative frequency distribution, and cumulative relative frequency distribution. I left off cumulative frequency, but we gotta make a table. Anytime you wanna make a table, your first column has always got to be the values of your variable. And my variable was number of, <laughs> number of cars sold in one week. So let's see, how many cars did get sell sold? 14 people sold three cars, so I've got a data value of three. Right? I see somebody sold four cars, five cars, six cars, and seven cars. Four, five, six, seven. All right, so just looking at this, I see that I have discrete numerical data. You can't sell 4.792 cars. All right, the first column after the data value is the frequency. So, so let's see what they were. It says here 14 people sold three, 19 sold four, 12 sold five, nine sold six, and 11 sold seven. Now I just wanna do a quick check to make sure my numbers are correct. If you remember, the frequency column should always total out to your sample size. So let me just make sure I haven't transposed a number. So let's do 14, 19, 12, nine, and 11, and I am getting 65, that's a good thing. So I'm just gonna put that here, that the total is 65. That's a good thing. All right, in terms of relative frequency, if you recall from chapter one, anytime you wanna build from frequency to relative frequency, you need to divide by sample size. So for all of these, I'm gonna divide by 65. I'm gonna do 14 divided by 65, 19 divided by 65, 12 divided by 65, nine divided by 65, and 11 divided by 65. And I should get a bunch of percentages, right? Because relative frequencies, they are percentages, proportions, ratios, fractions. And I'm lazy, so I'm gonna show you how I can have my calculator crunch all these numbers for once at me. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm gonna go into my lists. All right, let me go ahead and clear out L1. And I'm gonna put these numbers in. So 14, 19, 12, nine, and 11. So I will get my data in there. Now, your calculator is like a spreadsheet. So I'm gonna go up into L2, meaning L2 has the black background. Because what I would like to have happen is I would like each of these numbers to get divided by 65. But I don't wanna be on my calculation screen. I'm gonna to flip to it real quick. I don't wanna be here at writing 14 divided by 65, 19 divided by 65. I kinda like to just do it all at once. So you can do this in your list. If you're in L2 or any other list, go nuts, pick L3. I can define it, and again, when I say define it, L2's got the black background. I can say, hey, can you please take everything in L1 and can you divide it by 65? All right, so your calculator's gonna take these five numbers and divide them all by 65. As soon as I hit enter, you're gonna see that list auto-populate. And there come all of my relative frequencies. 
Now it's your call how many decimals you want to round off to. I'm going to go to three just because I feel like it. All right, so we got 0 0.215 and 0 0.292. 0 0.185, 0 0.138, and 0.169. Alright, now when I total this out, this should be 1, or pretty darn close to 1. We did have some funky numbers, so there's times when you round decimals and things don't work out quite the way you want. So let me go ahead and add these numbers up. Let me clear the screen out. So we got 0 0.215, 292. 185, 138, and 169. All right, and you can see when I hit enter, I'm getting 0 0.999, and that is super close to one, which is fine, because like I said, we had a round off error. By rounding at the third decimal, we get this round off error, right? It should ex be exactly one, it's not. And just for fun, I wanna show you, if I had actually summed this list, and I'll, I'll explain where you can go in a moment if you wanna sum it, just watch. If I sum this list, if I sum everything that was in L2, I would get exactly one. All right, so if they add up, if your calculator adds up all of these numbers with no decimal round off, it would tell you it was one. Now, if you wanna figure out where the sum button is, you hit second and stat. All right, let me scooch that up so you can see it. Second and stat, all right? And then you need to go over to your math option, your math menu, go down to option five and ask your calculator to sum L2. So second stat, math menu, option five, sum up L2, okay? All right, but we don't have to do all of that. This is fine, the total is 0.999 here, okay? And it's fine that there's a little bit of a decimal round off here. I'm even just gonna put a note here so that we're, we're aware of it. So this is due to a slight round off error. And just for consistency's sake, I'm gonna to put total over here so we know this is the total column. All right, so 65, oops, excuse me. And 0.999, okay. So it looks like we're, we're in okay shape so far. So now I need to build from relative frequencies to cumulative relative frequencies. So anytime I want to do that, it's zigzag time. So I'm going to zig this over here. We've got 0.215. And then we're going to roll. So I have, if I look at this, I need to do 0.215 plus 0.292. And I have 0.507. I'm going to add to it 0 0.815, 185, excuse me. And then 0.138. To 0.83 and then I'm going to add 0.169 and that's going to get me to 0.999 and again this is due to a slight round off error okay and that happens sometimes especially when you have pretty funky denominators, right? We got 65, it's not a nice whole, no well it is a whole number, but it's not like 20 or 50. It's, it's a little bit of an odd bird. All right, let's see if we can answer some of these, some of these questions here. So, I've got the first one, what does the frequency column sum to? Well, it summed to 65, which is a good thing, right? It should always total out to your sample size. What does the relative frequency column sum to? All right. It summed to 0.999, all right? And I just wanna say this is super close to one, which is what it should have summed to, but I had some round off errors. By rounding to three digits, I was off by about 0.001, okay? All right. And then as we move this up, it says, hey, what is the difference between relative frequency and frequency for each data value. All right, well, we've talked about this before, that when you're talking about frequencies, those are whole numbers, and relative frequencies are percentages. So let's, let's write that out. So a frequency is a whole number. All right, 
So in this case, it's the number of cars sold per week. Okay. And then relative frequency is a percentage. Right. In this case, that would be the percent of the number of cars sold. Let's just practice that with the sentence, right? We want to get in the habit of being able to write sentences. So before I answer part C, let's go back here and just pick one of these, these columns to interpret. So let's say I went with um, 5 and 12, and I want to put 5 and 12 into a sentence. How could I say 5 and 12? Well, let's, let's try and analyze this. If I talk about 5 and I talk about 12, what are the units on 5? Well, this is number of cars, right? And this is frequency. So I could say in a sentence, 12 salespersons sold five cars in that one week. Right? So 12 salespersons sold five cars in a week. If we want to compare that to relative frequency, use this number. So what if we had 5 and then 0.185? Well, the units on this are still numbers of cars. It's still our var variable. But the units on this are percentages. So we could say 18.5% of salespersons sold five cars in a week. So again, one is talking about whole numbers, one is talking about percentages. So that's the key difference. All right, key difference between relative frequency and frequency. One of them's whole numbers, one of them's percentages. All right, the last thing we're getting asked to do on this page is to use your calculator to plot a histogram. And then we want to go ahead and do that by hand. All right, so if I want to do that by hand, I'm going to just make the assumption that this is a frequency histogram that I'm asked to graph, not a cumulative frequency histogram. So if I'm going to go put that into my calculator, here we go. First thing we want to do is a little data entry, so stat enter. And just taking a look at my list, I have a bunch of junk right now, so let me go clear them out. All right. So I'm going to make a frequency histogram. So we're going to put the values of our variable in here. And then we're going to put our frequencies. All right, so get your data entered into those lists, a little data entry. Once you get those data values entered into your list, the next thing you need to do is adjust your stat plots. And to get up into your stat plots, we need to do second and y equals. And let's see what I got going on right now. It looks like the last thing I graphed was a modified box plot. I'm going to have to switch that because I'm being asked for a histogram. I've got one plot on, two plots off. That's good. So let me go edit this out. So the first thing I want to do is change the type. All right. Now, I did put the values of my variable in L1, but I put my frequencies into L2. Okay. So once I get that rolling, let me hit zoom 9. And I see that I have... A bunch of rectangles and I have some gaps here and I really shouldn't have any gaps I don't have any need for gaps so this is probably where I need to adjust my window so let me hit window and take a look at the X scale so they're making a rectangle every 0.6 cars and we don't want to do that our cars jumped by one unit at a time three to four to five to six to seven so I need to adjust this X scale and make it a one once you do that, once you've adjusted your window, don't hit zoom 9. If you hit zoom 9, this will go right back to 0.57. Hit graph. And that's looking a little better. Now, I would also make the argument that I can't quite see the right most uh, rectangle. It gets cut off. 
So I'm going to go just adjust the X max. So it looks like it's going 3 to 7.6. Um, why don't I just send that to 9? That seems like a reasonable number. Did I get to see it all? Now I can see it all, right? And if I trace it, you can see my frequency counts. 14, right? 19, 12, 9, and 11. Okay. And then the last part of this is saying sketch it, right? So I need to sketch this histogram. I need to take what I saw on my calculator and make a legit graph of it. So let's, let's start to plot this bad boy. Here we go. All right, so whenever you make me a graph, the variable always goes along the x-axis. So I've got here a number of cars sold. All right, so it looks like I'm going three through seven. So let me make marks on my x-axis for that. So we will do three, four, five, six, seven. All right, so let's put three, fours, fives, six, seven. If I look at my data values here, let me go back into my lists. It looks like the lowest frequency was nine and the highest was 19. So I, I think I'm gonna make my Y axis go by five. So I think I'll go five units at a time up the Y axis if I have enough space. Um, if I make them a little bit shorter, I probably could. So we'll go five, 10, 15, 20, if I'm looking at it, five, 10, 15, 20. And again, on this side of the curve, we have frequency. All right, or you could have written number of salespeople, right? Because those are the folks that were in our, uh, in our random sample. All right, so let's see, for three, we should be up at 14. And then we should jump to 19. And then down to 12. And then nine. And then 11. All right, let's go make some rectangles. this in class you don't have to do this part but I, I usually do I'll put the heights the frequency heights somewhere on the rectangles okay and so there's my frequency histogram right it's properly labeled and scaled meaning I have words and numbers on the x-axis it's labeled and scaled I've got words and numbers on the y-axis all right and and I got some rectangles and this didn't ask it um, if they had wanted us to, we could have also done, I could have made a cumulative, excuse me, I could have made a relative frequency histogram if I put these numbers into L2. I could have also made a cumulative relative frequency histogram if I put these numbers into L2. I just interpreted it to be a frequency histogram. All right, now let's crunch a bunch of statistics for this data set. So the first thing I'm being asked to do is to calculate the sample mean. Now I'm going to refer back to my data set here just so we have a visual. If I wanted to calculate the mean, there are a couple of ways you can do it. You can go into your list and you can enter in, in one list. You can enter the number 3 14 times. You can enter the number 4 19 times. The number 5 12 times. The number 6 9 times. And the number 7 11 times. So you could enter all 65 data values as long as you match up their frequencies. And just to demonstrate this, I, I put that, this data into L3. So you can see I have three written in here 14 times if I scroll down, right? And then you can see I switched to four, so on and so forth. And, and if I went to the bottom of my list, I'm going to scroll up and then go to the top because there's so many data values here. 
you can see that my, my last data value is in the 65th cell, so I do have all 65 data points. So you can do that, and again, keep in mind for this, I was in L3, so I can do one bar stats off of L3 and find the sample mean. So that's completely acceptable. No harm, no foul there. But I tend to be a little lazy. So if you notice in L1 and L2, I put the values of my variable and then I put the frequencies. And you can crunch all the same information and you can see I didn't have to put in 65 numbers here, right? I had, I had 65 numbers in L3. Here I only have to put in 10. But the calculator command, it, it requires just a little bit of a tweak. So let me remove this page since we have all of our data there. And if I have my frequencies in L2 and the values of my variable in L1, here's what you want to do. We'll go back to our home screen and just keep this number in mind, the 4.754 number. Let me clear that out. So I will do one variable stats off of L1, but I don't want to just take the average of the numbers in L1. I want to weight them with their frequencies in L2. So if you have frequencies in L2, you want to hit the comma key, and it's that button that's right above your 7 key. So I'm going to hit comma, and then I'll scroll all my calculator back down. So my variable is in L1, and my frequencies are in L2. So if you ever have the data presented in that manner, you just hit the comma L2. And as I do this, there we go. We've got an average of 4.75 cars sold per week. So let me write that down. The next statistic I'm asked to find is the variance, and we have a couple of options there. You can take this number, the 1.392286 number. Again, never use this, this sigma here. We can take 1.3922, since that's S, I could square that number. So I'm just going to type that in. I could do 1.3922864443 squared, and then I can get the variance, which would be 1.938. That's fine. Um, a second version of that, let me just clear this so that I have nothing on my calculator screen, is if I were to hit second and stat and go into my list menu, and we've, we've been over here briefly. If you go over to the math key or the math menu, you'll notice down here at seven there's a little arrow. And here's yet another way I could have found the standard deviation. Um, we get it in one variable stats, but if we go down to option eight, it'll actually give you your variance. So let me go do this, and I'll do L1 comma, oops, excuse me, L1 comma L2, and then it's going to give me my variance of 1.938. So let me write that down. Now I'm going to ignore the units on variance. I mean, technically they would be cars sold per week squared, but those units make no sense in the real world. And the only reason we have the variance is so we can square root it and get the standard deviation. So in terms of the standard deviation, again, you had two options. We could have gone one bar stat L1 comma L2 and read this number right here, 1.3922. I also could have gone back into that second and stat option, so I could call up my list menu again go over to math menu, and then I can do option seven, and I can feed my calculator L1 comma L2, again, variable and then the frequencies, and there's my standard deviation, 1.392. Now, for this one, I do need the units. It's a statistic, so it's got the same units as the variable, so 1.392 cars sold per week. Alright, in terms of my sample size, if you remember, it's 65, but also you can see it right here in one bar stats. You can see n equaling 65. So I have that. Alright, in terms of the mode, that is the data value that has the highest frequency. So let me clear my list and just go back into it. The value with the highest frequency, well the highest frequency here is 19, so that must have been four cars sold per week having the highest frequency, and that is my mode. All right, so moving from there, 
I'm gonna scooch this up. It looks like we're gonna go into some IQRs and all the quartile shenanigans. So let's get that going. Anytime I want the quartiles, I'm gonna run one of our stats. And again, I could either do it off of L3 all by itself, or I could do L1 comma L2. Doesn't really matter. It's just a difference of how you enter the data. Again, here I entered all 65 data values. Here I entered the variable values against their frequencies. So let me go back here again, one of our stats, I'm gonna go L1 comma L2. And let's see if we can find all of our quartiles. So Q1 looks to be four, Q3 looks to be six, Q2 is also four. Let me write all of those down. So we've got Q1 is four cars sold per week. Q2 was also four cars sold per week. And again, just a quick reminder that the second quartile is the same as the median. It's the 50th percentile. We could use the symbol Q sub 2, and we could write median. All right, Q3 was 6, so 6 cars sold per week. The IQR, it's Q3 minus Q1, so in this case we've got 6 minus 4 which would be two cars sold per week. Okay. So the next couple of questions are number crunching. Can we find the value of our variable, that is three standard deviations above the mean, and can we find the value of our variable that is 1.2 standard deviations below the mean? So here I'm gonna do some substitution. We found up top that the mean was 4.754. I would like to add to that three times the standard deviation and the standard deviation we found up top was 1.392. So let's crunch this number and see what value is three standard deviations above the mean. So 4.754, so you can barely see that, plus three times 1.392 and I'm looking at 8.93. Every statistic you crunch is going to have the same units as the value of your variable because these are talking about your variable and number of cars sold per week. So if you were able to sell almost nine cars in a week, you were about three standard deviations above the mean. Okay. Let's apply the same idea to this next question, I want to find the value that is 1.2 standard deviations below the mean. All right, so we're going to have 4.754 minus 1.2 times 1.392. And I'm going to put that expression into my calculator and see what it gives me back. 4.754 minus 1.2 times 1.392. And it looks like we got 3.084. And again, cars sold per week. So if you're selling about three cars in a week, you're, you're a little bit more than a standard deviation below the mean, because on average, we were selling closer to five cars. So if you're three, you're under, you're under the mean. And just as a note, if you're ever three standard deviations above the mean, so I just wanna say this, this value of your variable here that's a z-score, oops, let me write the word score a little better, a z-score here of positive three. That's quite literally what the z-score means, the value that is three standard deviations above the mean. On that same line of thinking, your z-score for this particular value would be negative 1.2, the negative being there because you were below the mean. And again, the mean is a measure of your center. So some folks are gonna be above the mean, some folks are gonna be below the mean. Some folks have positive z-scores, some folks have negative z-scores. All right, so the last part, part E in here, actually wants us to figure out, do we have any outliers? And this will be great, because if we need to uh, 
graph a box plot, we want to know if there are outliers present. All right, so we're back to our three-step process. Okay, Any time you want to determine if there are outliers present in your data, you want to go ahead and build that safety zone. So step one, I need the IQR. IQR is always upper quartile minus lower quartile. So in this case, that was six minus four, which was two. All right, then whatever number you get in step one, multiply that by one and a half. So I'm gonna do 1.5 times two, and I can do that one in my head, that's gonna give me 3.5. Actually, apparently I can't do that in my head. <laughs> oh my goodness, it's not 3.5, I was adding them. Here, and just to check, right? This is a good thing I check. Two times 1.5 is three. All right, so that's just a little humility check on me, that is awesome. All right, the next thing I wanna do is build my safety zone. I want to lower the threshold of Q1, and I want to raise the threshold of Q3. So as I look at this, Q1, we had 4, so I will do 4 minus 3, which is 1. And here I will do Q3 plus 3, which is 6 plus 3, which is 9. All right, that is my safety zone. So I'm going to go consult my calculator and see what the values of my variable were. So let me go back in here. So let's look at the values of my variable. The lowest value was a three. Three is well inside the safety zone, so I don't have any outliers on the low end of my data. If I look at my high value here, it was seven. Seven is also well inside the safety zone, so I don't have any outliers on the high end of my data. So my conclusion here is that there were no outliers. And if this is your first time seeing this symbol, it's a little math symbol we use, you would say it out loud with the word therefore. Okay, what we're going to do next is construct a modified box plot. And as we saw on the last part, part E, there were no outliers in our data set. So technically for this one, a modified box plot is the same as a regular box plot. But anytime I want to make a box plot, I need the five number summary. So I'm gonna go back to it in my calculator and I'm gonna find all of my one bar stats. Now again, if you remember from the last page, I have my values of my variable in L1 and my frequencies in L2. Just so we would have something different there, I, or a different option, I also put all 65 data values one at a time into L3. So you have two options. You can do one bar stats off of L3 and you can see all of your five number summary. But if you ever have the option of just putting values of your variable in frequency because you have a frequency table, you have the option of doing one var stats off of L1, you put the comma next to it to separate the two lists, and tell your calculator, hey, that the frequencies are in L2. So when you separate with the comma, your calculator will interpret this second list as the frequency list. All right, so let's go find the five number summary. So I got three, four, four, six and seven. So let me write that down somewhere. So I've got a min at three. I've got Q1 and the median at four. I've got Q3 at six and the max at seven. Okay, great. So as I go to do this, I need an x-axis. Your variable always goes along that x-axis. So let me go start to put that in. Now if I look at my spread, it's from three to seven. So I don't really need to go too far. So let's try this. So three to four to five to six to seven. That'll be a pretty small box plot. I think just looking at it, I'm actually going to go ahead and erase this and make my scale a little larger just so we can see a better looking box plot. So let me erase this. And I think I'll make each, each tick mark an inch long because we do have so much room here. So I'll go three to four, five, six, seven. So three, four, five, six, seven. 
Okay. So three, four, five, six, seven. And this is going to be number of cars sold. Okay. So as we start to go through this, I'm going to put little vertical bars over the correct values. So we've got one at three. We technically have two, two vertical bars at four, but I only need to write it once. And I gotta go to six. And then I need to go to seven. All right, now this is gonna seem funky, but you wanna box the middle 50% of your, your um, data. And that's from four to six. So if you look at the middle 50%, it's here between four and six. So here's gonna be my box. All right, so we got that. Now I'm gonna go ahead and label everything. And for me personally, since this one has a doubling up, I'm not just gonna put the number four here. I'm actually gonna label the statistics so it's a little bit more clear. So this is the min at three. This is Q1 and the median here at four. This is Q3 at six. And this is the max at seven. So there are plenty of data sets where statistics double up. We saw it double up here. The median and Q1 were the same value, so no problem. But you can see it's, it, if, you weren't, if you weren't aware that the median and Q1 were the same, same number, you, you'd be wondering where the little median bar is, right? And so technically the median bar could have been here or here if it had doubled up, but you wouldn't know unless I specified. So I always like to add those details just so again, I, my general rule of thumb is somebody coming in without reading any of the problems should be able to interpret what my graph is saying. So if we look at this next two, um, this next question, it says between what two values do the middle 50% of your data lie? And the middle 50% is always between Q1 and Q3. Right? This, this is the bottom 25%. If we had any space between Q1 and the median, that's the second 25%. Median Q3 is the next 25, Q3 and the max the next 25. But this is your middle 25%. So between what two values? Between four and six cars per week. Six cars sold, excuse me, per week. All right. Now just to check, I can go over here, okay? Let me turn my stat plots on. If I look at my plots right now, I've got one on and two off. So I'm gonna adjust that. I'm gonna go turn this one. I'm, I'm, I'm happy having one on, but right now it's making a histogram with the values of my variable in L1 and the frequencies in L2. I, I need to change the type and I'm gonna modify that box plot. Even though I did the calculations and I don't believe there's outliers, it doesn't hurt for my calculator to check. So I'll hit zoom nine. And then there we go, that box plot looks a lot like mine, right? So if I hit trace, there's the min, Q1, the median, the Q3, and the max. So that's looking good. And if you wanted to compare it, well, don't forget, I do have my data, all 65 data values in L3. So let me show you how I could have done that plot. I'll go down to plot two and do that. So if I look at plot two, it's off right now. I'll, I'll turn it on in a moment. And I do have the modified box plot, but my, my original data is not in L2, it's in L3. And since I have every single data point in L3, I will leave the frequency at one. So let me go here, turn this off, head down here at L3. So we've got these two different plots we're gonna make, but you can imagine when I hit zoom nine, it's going to be the same graph. There they are, same plot. So you've got two different ways of making these plots and it's completely dependent on how you enter the data into your calculator. If you enter your data in your calculator with the values of your variable here and the frequencies in L2, use L1 and L2. If you entered all 65 data points into L3, use L3 and 1, okay? All right, so we're getting towards the end. Let's take a look at the next question that's coming up at us. So this next one says, what is the Z-score for a car, car salesperson with a weekly sale 
of three cars. All right, so we had a formula for z-scores. So z-scores, we always do value minus mean in ratio to the standard deviation. And before we actually crunch this, if you remember from a little while ago, the mean was 4.754. So this person is below the mean, right? They're only selling three cars a week, which means I should have a negative z-score. So the value for this particular salesperson is three. If we go back to all of those previous statistics we calculated in the, in the last page, remember that the mean was 4.754 and the standard deviation was 1.392. All right, now I've mentioned this a few times, but it's always good to repeat. Please be careful when you're calculating this on your calculator. I get this all the time, where students will just plug this in and they won't use proper parentheses. So what your calculator winds up doing is PEMDAS. It's going to divide 1.392 into 4.754 and then subtract. So it's gonna do the division first and then the subtraction. And what you actually want is you want the subtraction on that numerator done first, and then you want whatever this number is to be divided by 1.392. So you have a couple of options. Here's the way I usually do it. I will just do the numerator first, so I'll do 3 minus 4.754, and then I will divide that number by the standard deviation. So I will break my work up into two calculator commands. But let me write this down, negative 1.26. Again, just taking note, it is negative, and it should have been because this person's um, data value was below the mean. Okay, So that's one way of doing it. You also have the option of using parentheses. So if I put parentheses around that numerator, if I protect it with parentheses, your calculator knows to do the grouping symbols and subtract first, and there you go. You can get that answer. Okay. If you hadn't used parentheses, if you just did 3 minus 4.754 and then divided it by 1.392, you can see you would get the incorrect answer. So you just want to be careful when you've got fractions. Okay. All right. So last but not least, we need to describe our socks. So let's start with shape. So I'm just going to refer to my calculator here since I have these up. All right. So in terms of shape, remember the median is here. So the right half of my data is way longer, at least its spread is way longer than the left half of my data. Because my left half only goes from here, right half goes here. So since the right tail is longer, this is skewed right. Oh, let me scooch this up so you can see all of it. All right, so we're gonna have a skewed right graph. Okay. Another option for determining this skewness is you could have crunched one of our stats one more time. So let me just do it. I could have done one of our stats, I'll go L1 against L2. And keep in mind, there's the mean and there's the median. And in this problem, the mean is larger than the median. Or if I was gonna look at it in the x-axis, and let me scooch back down here. I can't grab my paper, there we go. All right, if I head back down here, Right, so the median was here at 4, and the mean is here at 4.75. So when the mean is to the right of the median, right, because here's the median, excuse me, here's the mean, here's the median. This, this mean is to the right of this median. This mean is larger than this median. Whenever that happens, you have a skewed right distribution. So there's a numerical way of assessing, yes, this thing is definitely skewed right, and we also had the visual way when we were just taking a look at the box plot. All right, so for outliers, we already said it, there were none. Okay. For the center, you could quote either the mean or the median. I'm just gonna go with the median. So this would be four cars sold per month. For the spread, I could go spread, range, IQR, standard deviation, or variance. I'm gonna go with the range. I had a low of three cars sold per month and a high of seven cars sold per month. So my range is four cars sold per month. All 
But when as I look at this, I see that I didn't actually write the word median here. So let me make sure I put that in there. Okay. And that, believe it or not, is the end of chapter two. All right, thanks, gang. Good luck. <laughs>